Well, Merry Christmas and welcome to Center Church, whether you are in person or with us online. We're really, really glad that you're here. And here is something that we all know. You ready? You cannot avoid Christmas, right? You just simply can't avoid it. It is too big. This is the lesson that the Grinch learned, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you take all the presents out of Whoville, Christmas will still come. And I know that that reality feels different to different people. Some of you love Christmas. A friend of mine that's here tonight, I won't mention him by name, spent seven hours wrapping gifts the other day. Do you know how long seven hours? It's an entire work day. Seven, you could drive to like Atlanta in seven hours, right? He spent seven hours wrapping gifts. I have another friend who's been counting down to Christmas for 60 days. 60, like the 60 days of Christmas, right? I've never heard of that before. Um, so some of you are just cannot be more excited that we are at the week of Christmas. But I know for others, Christmas is a really difficult time. Because maybe this is the first year that, that grandpa's not going to be at Christmas. Or, man, it just reminds you of what you don't have, right? You're like, man, I'm, I'm still single, right? Like it's another Christmas has come and gone and I'm still single. Or maybe um, it's, Christmas forces you to look the dysfunction in your family in the face, right? Like you can kind of, man, you can have, uh, kind of avoid it most of the year, but then Christmas you sort of have to deal with the brokenness and the hardship that's, that's in your family. So I don't know where you're coming from tonight. I don't know if you're really, really excited or you're nervous or you're kind of a mixture of the two, but here's what we all know. You have to respond to Christmas, don't you? There's no avoiding it. It is just too big, and it turns out that Christmas has always been that way, that for 2,000 years it's been that way, that actually the very first Christmas was that way. And what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 2 is that even in the very first Christmas, people were responding. You just could not avoid it. And what we're going to see in our text today is three different groups of people and how they respond to the birth of Jesus. And I think if you listen carefully, you're going to be able to identify with one of those three groups, and it's going to help you understand kind of maybe where your heart is this Christmas season. So if you have a Bible, meet me in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, which is where we're going to be. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, the famous wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem. So we don't know how long it's been since Jesus was born. The text doesn't tell us, but we know that it's long enough for these wise men from the east to travel by animal to Jerusalem. So depending on weather, we're talking between three and nine months. So if you want to be really, really biblical, here's what you need to do. Go home to your nativity set, grab the wise men, and put them in the kitchen until July, okay? Like that is what would be the most biblical approach to this because the wise men were not there at uh, the manger scene. They weren't there at the birth of Christ. And part of what I want to do tonight, honestly, is help root the Christmas story in its historical context, right? I want to help root the Christmas story in its historical context because that's what Matthew, the author, was doing. Do you see all that information he gave in verse 1? Right? He says, uh, Bethlehem of Judea, while under the rulership of a man named Herod, who is the king. What's he doing? He's helping you understand that this is a historical occurrence. He does not start Matthew chapter, this, chapter 2 this way. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Right? Like that, that's not what Matthew does. And the reason for that is that Christianity is not based on myth. It's not based on religious intuition. It's not based on someone's good intentions. It's based on historical occurrences. It's based on a historical event that happened in a very real place where you could go and visit. And so what Matthew is doing from the very onset, he's saying, hey, here is where this happened. It was in this place, in this region, under this ruler. It'd be, it'd be like him saying, hey, Jesus was born during the Obama administration. And he was born in Richmond, which was in the state of Virginia. Okay, so he's orienting us. He's saying this is a historical event. It is not just somebody's idea. So with, with that in mind, who were the wise men, right? Maybe you've got a picture of wise men in your head. Well, who were these guys? Well, the Greek word is literally magi, which is where we get the word magician from. And it says they were coming from the east. And so what scholars think is they were probably astrologers who served in the court of the king of Persia. Okay, so Persia was a kingdom then. It was far over in the east. So think modern day kind of Iraq, India, that region. And so these guys were most likely astrologers who were in the court of the king of Persia. And here's what you need to understand. Astrology was the discipline in that day. It was the discipline of the elite. And so these were the most highly educated people in their entire society. 
So these were the Ivy League professors of Persia. So these men were very, very educated. They were also very influential. They served in the court of the king. They knew the right people. They were involved in the right conversations. They had influence and power. Here's what else we know. They were extremely wealthy. They were extremely wealthy. We know that because when they get to Jesus' house, they offer him these extravagant gifts. They were also able to take six months off of work. Only rich people can do that, right? Like, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and you're like, hey, what, are you going to go to the beach this summer? And they're like, yes, the entire summer. And you're like, not like, so the whole thing, they're like, yep, I'm going to the beach for three months. And you're like, we are in a different economic bracket, you and I, right? Because like when you're very wealthy, you can do that, right? You can go to your second house for six months. Well, that's who these guys were. They were highly educated. They were influential. They were powerful and they were wealthy. You know what they were? They were what most Americans aspire to be. They were what most Americans aspire to be. That, they're what most UVA students aspire to be. They were what everyone in America wants to be. But here's what's really fascinating they had all those things, and yet they weren't satisfied. They're like us. We have so much, and yet we're not satisfied. And we know that because they show up in Jerusalem looking for something. They go on this huge, long, dangerous, costly trip because they were looking for something. What was it? Verse 2. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You see, ancient people believed that they could discern the future by studying the stars. And actually, a lot of modern people believe that. So I saw an article in the New York Times that 44% of millennials use horoscopes. Horoscopes use astrology to try to help you discern your future, right? So same kind of idea. So these guys would spend their evening studying the stars, and the most amazing thing happened one night. A new star appeared, a star that they'd never seen before. And somehow, we don't know how, somehow they were able to connect this new star with the birth of the king of the Jews, how did Persian people even know about the Jews? Well, quick history lesson. There's something that happened in the Old Testament called the exile. And that was when God's people were, were captured and taken away from their homeland in Israel and scattered across all the known world. And a population of them ended up in Persia. And they established a community there and they studied the scriptures there. And so it was very likely that these Persian uh, astrologers were familiar with the history and the culture and the scriptures of the Jews. And so somehow, maybe they had good friends that were Jews. They put together, this star is the star of the long-awaited Messiah of the Jewish people. And this was so compelling that they packed up all their stuff and they went on this long journey. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So who was Herod? Well, Herod was the Roman ruler of that region, and he referred to himself as the king of the Jews. And the text says that he was troubled. And you, can, you, know, you, you might understand that as he was angry, or he was scared, or he was frustrated. That word in Greek kind of has all of those ideas. Why? Why was Herod angry? Why was he troubled? Because he found out that there was another king, and it wasn't him. They found, he found out there was a real king of the Jews, and it was not him. Verse 4, And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Herod didn't know his Bible very well. Okay, he was, a, like, he was like a lot of politicians today. He paid lip service to religion, but it wasn't really a part of his life. So what did he do? Well, he did the same thing politicians do today. He formed a religion and faith committee, right? And he, and he brought in the scribes and the, fair, you know, the chief priests, and these were professional religious people, okay? They were people that operated around the temple in Jerusalem, and they spent their time studying the scriptures and arguing over rabbinic interpretation, okay? They were kind of the egghead theologians of the day. So he says, all right, committee, advise me. And this is what they said, verse 5. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, that's where the Messiah is going to be born. For so it is written by the prophet Micah, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they knew immediately where the Messiah would be born. They said, Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, it's a prophecy, Bethlehem. Okay, so the Religion and Faith Committee did their job, and you know, Herod was very happy. Well, what's, you know, what is Bethlehem? We've heard, you know, little town of Bethlehem. What is it? Well, it was a village. It, it, in fact, was little, okay? And it was about six miles south of Jerusalem. Six miles south of Jerusalem. A fun fact, it is where the book of Ruth takes place in the Old Testament, and it was the hometown of King David, okay? It was the hometown of King David. So Bethlehem's about six miles south of Jerusalem. And if you go through this passage, you'll notice Matthew says Bethlehem four times. He's, it's like over and over, you're like, why is he so obsessed with talking about Bethlehem? Well, the reason is that according to prophecy, the Messiah had to be from Bethlehem. The problem was that everyone who knew Jesus thought he was from Galilee. You ever thought about that? 
I mean, everyone who heard him teach, heard, saw him feed the 5,000, saw him walk on water, all of that happened in Galilee, not in Bethlehem. And here's what you have to understand. Galilee was the backwoods, okay? Judea was cultured. It had education. It had wealth. It had French restaurants. Just kidding, right? But it had stuff going on. And Galilee was the middle of nowhere to the degree that people in Galilee had an accent, they spoke country, okay? Like, they sounded like hicks to people from Judea. So I'm not kidding. This is what Jesus would have sounded like when he walked around Judea teaching, pray for those who persecute you, right? Like, that is what Jesus would have sounded like to them. And so here's what they said. No way could this guy be the Messiah. The Messiah is not from Galilee. He's from Judea. He's from where the action is. He's from where the theology is made, right? And so what Matthew is doing is very intelligent. He's anticipating an objection, and he said, hey, I know what you're thinking, you're thinking that Messiah has to, has to be from Judea. Well, here's the, here's the thing. He is. He is. Jesus is from Bethlehem. He just grew up in Galilee. So Matthew kind of anticipates that objection and then answers it. All right, here's verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men, the commit, or the wise men secretly. That's important, secretly. And ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Give me the information. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. What's Herod trying to do? Herod is trying to control the narrative. Herod wants all the information so he can shape who knows what and who thinks what about this baby. He either wants to control this baby or eliminate this baby. He doesn't want to worship this baby. And the reason we know why is in just a few verses, he's going to try to kill baby Jesus. And he's going to go so far as to kill every single child under two years old in the entire region. That's what a psycho Herod was. Here's what we know about King Herod. He was so paranoid that he had people kill his own wife and children to protect his claim to the throne. That is who Herod was, and he was troubled. He was angry because he heard about a king that was coming, and it was not him. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, here's what's fascinating. These men studied stars. It was their profession. It was their hobby. It was their education. So do you know what God did? God used their profession to get them to the scriptures. Did you notice that? He entered into what they were interested in. He entered into their life, and the star brought them to Jerusalem, but it wasn't enough. The star got them to Jerusalem, and the scriptures got them to Jesus. The star got them to the, to the scribes and the religious committee. They said, here's the scriptures. Here's where he's born. And then the scriptures got them to Jesus. God does the same thing today. God does the same thing in our lives. He will often engage with you in some hobby or some profession or, th or through some relationship to get you to the scriptures. We just don't often call them stars. You know what we call them? We call them mom or dad or youth pastor or friend in college or coworker who invited me to church. Those are stars that God is using to draw you to the scriptures. There's a girl in our church named Abby uh, who a couple months ago invited her coworker Brielle to come to church. And after a few months, Brielle ended up becoming a Christian. Right? We got to baptize her over the summer. It was, it was really powerful. And I was talking to Abby about this, and she was just blown away that God worked through her in such an incredible way in Brielle's life. She was like, all I did was invite her to church. What was Abby? Abby was Brielle's star. Abby was Brielle's star. She just didn't know it. The truth is, if you're here tonight and you are a Christian, God wants you to be a star for someone else. God wants you to be a star for your neighbors and for your family you're going to see over Christmas and for your coworkers. God wants you to be a star for that person on the side of the road that needs help. God wants you to be a star in the lives of people in our community, just like God used a star to get the wise men to the scriptures. He wants to use you to get people to the scriptures. The easy way to do that is invite people to church because we're going to go through the scriptures every, every single Sunday. It's what we do. So God used the star to get them to Jerusalem and then used the scriptures to get them to Jesus. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So when they finally get to Jesus' house, they fall down and they worship. And then they offer him gifts, right? We've all heard that, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then they were warned Hey, don't go back to Herod. He's bad news. Go back to your homeland by another route. And so that's what they do, right? And thus concludes maybe the most famous Christmas story that there is, right? We all kind of go like, man, isn't that, an isn't that a cute story, right? Like, isn't that an interesting story in the gifts and stuff? What are we supposed to do with this story? Like, what impact does this have for us at all? Well, here's 
Here's what's fascinating. A New Testament scholar, Craig Keener, points out that Matthew intentionally wrote this narrative to help us identify with one of three different groups of people. There's three different groups of people in this story. There's Herod, there's the religious leaders, and there's, there's the wise men, and they represent three different responses to Christmas. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through those three different responses, and as I do, just ask yourself, which of these resonates with me? Which of these is most like me? And here's the first one. Response number one, anger. Response number one, anger. The text says that Herod was troubled. He was angry. He was mad. He was frustrated. Why? Because Jesus came into the world not primarily as a teacher or a healer or a helper, but as a king, as the king. That's what Christ means, anointed king. Did Jesus teach? Did Jesus heal? Did Jesus help? Yes, but his primary identity was anointed king. And here's what Herod knew. There can only be one king. There can only be one king. Herod wanted to be the king, and so a claim to kingship made him mad. He wanted to control Jesus or he wanted to eliminate Jesus because Jesus threatened his power and his control and his personal autonomy. So he got mad. Let me ask you, when Jesus threatens your power and your control and your personal autonomy, do you get mad? Do you get mad when Jesus comes into your life and says lovingly, hey, I know that you thought you were the king of your money and of your time and of your sexuality, but, but you're not. I am. I'm the king of that. Right? Do you get mad when Jesus comes into your life and says, hey, I know that you thought you were the king of your unforgiveness and you've been nursing this grudge and it feels good to nurse this grudge, but actually I'm the king of that area and you need to forgive them. When Jesus comes into your life and my life and says, actually, I'm the king of that area, do you respond with anger like I do sometimes? You see, we don't like to admit it, but we're a lot more like Herod than we'd like to admit, right? Jesus comes up and gets all up in our business. Or how about when somebody in the church gets in your business, right? And says, hey, I, you know, you really haven't been prioritizing church. I've only seen you there like two times this Sunday. What do we do? Oh, gosh, we've got six excuses, a whole other list of why they can't talk to us about that. Well, you don't know what's going on at work, and you don't know what's going on in my family. You want to talk to me about church? Well, let's talk to you about blah, 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 right? What is that? That is us being angry and being like, nope, Jesus, you can't talk to me about that. The truth is, when Jesus confronts us about some area of our life, we have two options. We can change our minds, or we can change Jesus. And unfortunately, many, many people change Jesus. There's a famous illustration of this. About 30 or 40 years ago, a group of white, middle-class, liberal Protestant scholars got together, and um, they did not believe in the sufficiency of the scriptures. They didn't believe in the authority of the scriptures. They believed that the Bible was full of error and myth. And so this is what they said. Let's all come together and decide what we think the real Jesus really said. All right? So they spent three or four weeks together, and they like hashed this whole thing out. And they came up with this list of things. Of this, he didn't say this, and he did say this, and he didn't do this, and he did do this. And then they published it and called it the real Jesus, which I think is a bit of a presumptuous title. And what I love is that there was a, a critic of theirs, a contemporary critic, who looked at their findings and he said something that was very insightful and shrewd. This is what he said. You know, it's amazing that the real Jesus sounds exactly like a 20th century white middle-class liberal scholar. That's amazing. It's amazing that Jesus only said things that you find completely appropriate and that he didn't say any of the things that you find challenging. That's amazing. Right? What was his point? They didn't find the real Jesus. They just created a Jesus in their own image. Right? They didn't want to change their mind, so they just changed Jesus. And that, you know, it's easy to look at that and see, see what happened, but honestly, we do this a lot just in a little bit more subtle ways. Here's, here's what this sounds like. We tell ourselves, God wants me to be happy, so whatever I deem is going to make me happy, I'm going to do, even if the Bible is pretty clear I shouldn't be doing that. Or we kind of take the common sense approach and we say, well, like, I, we're really into one another, and we're married in our hearts, so it's, it's fine if, you know, if we're living together or we're sleeping together or whatever. I'm sure God understands. Or here's another one. Um, God would never call me to suppress my sexual desires. So this relationship must be okay, even though it goes against what his word says. The truth is God calls us to suppress our sexual desires all the time. Right? For 23 years, God called me to suppress my sexual desires until I was married. Now that I am married, God calls me to suppress my desires if they're ever for someone that's not my wife. Right? The truth is, God is very clear about what he's called us to. We just often don't like it, and so we either ignore it, or we kind of have these like, narratives in our head. Like, well, God, like, where does the Bible ever say like, God's primary goal in your life is to make you temporarily happy? Like, I've, there's no, I've never found that verse, okay? Like, it's not like Psalm whatever. It's, 
Like, that's, what is that? That's America. That's like what America, American culture says is that the greatest good in your life is, holy, is happiness, but God says, no, the greatest good in your life is holiness because that is where true joy is found. So when Jesus comes into our life as a king and he starts to confront us on something, then what do you do? Do you change your mind or do you change Jesus? Right? Pastor Tim Keller, who served in Manhattan for many, many years, put it this way. I thought this was very insightful. He said, if the God that you worship can never offend you or tell you you're wrong, you're not worshiping the real God. You're worshiping a figment of your imagination. Because if God is God, he has to be able to disagree with you, right? Like, he has to be able to cross your will sometimes. And if your God never does that, then you're not worshiping the real God. You're worshiping probably an American, Americanized version of what you would like. When Jesus came into the picture, Herod was angry. He was troubled because Jesus said, I'm the king. When Jesus comes into your life and he says, hey, I'm the king of this area, do you get troubled? Do you get angry? Do you push him away and change him? Or the second thing you could do is you could change your mind. And this is simply what the Bible calls repentance. Repentance looks like this. What the Bible teaches is not what I used to think. It's not what my professors taught me. It's not even what my parents believe. But I trust God's character. I trust God's love and I trust God's word. And so when God's word confronts my opinion, I obey God's word, even though I don't always understand why it teaches what it teaches. You know, obedience is not really obedience until you wouldn't do it without Christ, right? Like if, if everything we're doing, we would be doing with or without Jesus. That's, we're not really living distinctly Christian lives. We're just living maybe conservative lives or traditional lives or whatever life you would live. But it's when our lives start to look different because of what Jesus has taught that we're actually being formed into Christ's likeness, formed into his image. So the first response we see in this text is anger. Anger. Herod got angry. Here's the second response that we see. Response number two, apathy. Apathy. The text says that the religious leaders knew exactly where Jesus was going to be born. I mean, Bible trivia champions, okay? Like, boom, Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. But you know what's interesting? None of them went. None of them went. It was six miles away. That's like from here to Target. Like, it is not far. Some of you are like, that's so far. It's because you live in Charlottesville. It's not that far, okay? The Magi went. They had traveled hundreds of miles, and they just kept going. And yet these religious leaders would not be inconvenienced to go six miles. Why? Because they knew a lot about the Bible, but they did not treasure Jesus. Unfortunately, there are churches all around the country filled with people just like that. People who go to church, people who know some Bible verses, were maybe involved in youth group growing up, but they don't really treasure Jesus. They don't have any affection for him. Going to church and studying their Bible and being involved in some sort of group feels like a burden. It feels like drudgery. And I think the reason for that is that most of those people aren't actually Christians. They've never been born again, because here's what the Bible says. When you become a Christian, genuinely, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and you know what he does? He starts to give you new taste buds. All of a sudden, you start to desire the things of God. You start to desire the scriptures. You want to be in church. You want to be in community. And the best example of this is when you meet someone who's just become a Christian, because they're just gobbling it all up. I love studying the Bible with new Christians, because they don't know how to pronounce the word Philistines, but they actually want to read their Bibles. I would much rather do that than be like these people that, like, they can tell me all the tribes of Israel and all this stuff, but, like, they won't ever have a quiet time. And I'm just like, ah, oh, like, this is killing me. You know what it's like to, to try to live the Christian life? It's miserable to try to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. It's like trying to scrape ice off of your car without turning the engine on first. Okay, big ice storm this last week, right? Well, I go out on, like, Thursday morning to scrape out, and the very first thing I did was turn the cars on. Why? Because once the engine gets going and you have internal heat, what's going to happen? The ice starts to melt. Now I'm like scraping stuff off in one, right, one sweep. But gosh, if you don't turn the engine on, it's brutal, right? You're out there, you're cold, you're miserable, you're grumpy, you're not making any progress. If you're trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, you are going to be miserable and you're going to be cold and you're going to be grumpy, right? When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and starts to change you. That didn't happen for these men. So they knew lots of information about the Bible. They knew when to stand and when to sit down in church. They could tell you chapter and verse on Bible trivia, but they didn't care at all about Jesus. Let me ask you, does apathy define your relationship to Christ? Does apathy define your relationship to him this holiday season? Is it just like another thing on the list that you have to do so you don't feel grumpy? If that's the case, it might be because you've never, never truly become a Christian. Here's what the Bible teaches. You cannot inherit faith. You cannot inherit faith. You cannot be born as a Christian. You can only be born again as a Christian. Jesus said as much in, in John chapter 3, 
Verse 3. He said this, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the question is, does apathy define your spiritual life? If so, you, you may not actually be a Christian, but you can be. You can be through repentance and faith. The Holy Spirit can come into your life and start to change you and give you a passion for Christ. Do you know one of the reasons that I love it when I see people raising their hands and being expressive in worship? It's not because it makes you more holy. It's because it's an expression of passion. It's the opposite of apathy. You know what kind of drives me nuts is when people have both their hands in their pockets and they're like doing this. And some of you are like, oh, he saw me, you know? Like, I'm not saying that's like sin or something. I'm just saying that like, if you get super excited when a 20-year-old on the UVA basketball team hits a jump shot, I need to see some hands in the air in church, okay? Because sometimes people are like, Josh, I'm not expressive. I'm like, no, you are expressive. It just, you just have to find the right thing, right? We're all expressive. In different ways, we don't all have to be expressive in the same way, but we're all expressive about things that we're passionate about. And so my desire is that, man, we would be a church full of people passionate about Christ, and so we would be expressive in worship. You don't have to look like me in worship, but I do want you to be expressing your joy and your love for Christ. Unfortunately, these religious leaders knew a lot about the Bible, but they didn't care much about the hero of the Bible, so they were apathetic. Which leads us to the last response. Response number three, adoration. Adoration. I love this passage because it's so surprising. The people that you think would worship Jesus don't, and the people that you don't think would worship Jesus do. Like, don't, don't miss this. The wise men were pagans. I mean, they're absolute pagans. These were like people who never went to church, knew nothing about the Bible, could not pronounce Philistines, inked all the way up and down, like serious histories and past. Boom, God changes their life. I mean, that was the wise men. And what we see from this text is that in this moment, they experienced personal conversion. They experienced personal conversion. The reason I say that is that the word they, that is used in the Greek, worship, they fell down and worshiped him, is the word to, to give adoration to a god, right? So in some way, we don't know exactly how they understood who Jesus was, and in that moment, they fell down and worshiped. They became Christians. And what I love is in just two verses, you see three characteristics of their worship. I love it. And these are three characteristics of genuine Christianity. And these are three characteristics that I hope can come to increasingly define our church. Here's the first one, letter A, joy joy. Look at verse 10. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That is four different words to say the same thing. Why is Matthew doing that? Because he's just trying to cram. He's like, they were overjoyed. They could not get enough. They were beside themselves with joy. Here's what this teaches us. True Christianity is joyful Christianity. True Christianity is joyful Christianity. Look, I'm not saying you can't have bad days, but if your life is defined by just always being grumpy and always being you know, disappointed and feel like you're always being snubbed and you're just like always sarcastic and cynical. I'm like, do you get the gospel? Here's the thing. Christians are commanded to rejoice. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Why does he say it twice? Because he think, I'm sure Paul is like, they're not going to believe this. Because we tend to think we rejoice in our circumstances, right? And our lives are hard. Like 2020 has been a, it's been hard. So if we're rejoicing in our circumstances, we would not rejoice always, but Christians are not called to rejoice in their circumstances, but in their Savior. Here's the thing. The more that Jesus becomes in your life, the more that you treasure him, the more important he is in your life, the more you're able to rejoice even when things are hard. The more you care about your eternal destination rather than your temporal circumstances, the more your joy will be unassailable by this world. And here's the thing. Do you know what the most powerful witness to the truthfulness of Christianity is? When people are rejoicing in their suffering. Because when you see that happening, you're like, something supernatural is going on here. That's what we see happen in the wise men's life. They, they got it. Here is the king of kings and lord of lords who has come to save his people from their sins, and we get to be part of those people, even though we are not ethnic Israel. Even though we have been living as pagan wild men for the last 50 years, we can be saved from our sins. True Christianity is joyful Christianity, and my prayer is that our church would be marked by that. Not, not fake spirituality where we act like everything is okay, but a deep-seated joy because we know where our hope is found. Our anchor is in Christ, and that cannot be shaken. Here's the second characteristic, letter B, humility. Humility. See how in verse 11 it says they fell down and worshiped? Think about what an incredible posture of humility that was for these men. I mean, don't, don't miss this. These men were wealthy, they were educated, they were powerful, and they were older. And Mary and Joseph were teenagers living in probably a very small shack that had a dirt floor. And the wise men fell down, and they got their expensive robes dirty, and they worshiped Jesus. Why? 
Because in some supernatural way, they were able to discern in that moment, before us is sitting the King of kings and the Lord of lords in human flesh. God Almighty, who hung the stars in the sky, is dwelling before us. And when you recognize Jesus as the one true anointed king, there is no place for pride in his presence. You fall down on your face and you worship him. Here's the thing. Christianity will humble you if you get it. Because here's what Christianity says. Do you know what you brought to your salvation? Sin. That's it. In other religious systems, it's like, oh, you were saved because you kept the five pillars and you went to Mecca and you did the eightfold path and you're a good person. You know what? Religion says there are good people and the bad people. Christianity says there are bad people and there's Jesus. So if you believe the gospel, here's what you believe. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not bad, dead. Not needed to turn over a new leaf, dead. No hope, so bad, the only way that God could save you was to become a human and to hang on a cross. That's who you are outside of Christ. But God loves you so much. He's so rich in mercy that he made you alive together with Christ. Praise the Lord. Here's my question. If you really believe that, how do you ever get off being proud? How do you not become a humble, gracious, patient person? Do you know what the world needs more of? Humble, gracious, patient people. Not more contempt, not more pride, not more scorn. My prayer for our church is that the gospel would go so deep in our heart that we'd be humble. We would assume the best about one another. We would give one another the benefit of the doubt. And we would not look out into our community or our world with judgment. But instead we would look out with kindness and conviction. And we would never say that you're some sort of different kind of sinner than me, but we would say we are all in the same category, dead in sin, in need of a Savior. Praise the Lord, Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, I have called to come si called sinners to repentance. If you are not a sinner, Jesus has nothing for you. If you are a sinner, he can forgive you and give you the Holy Spirit and give you an eternal inheritance. The wise men got that. It doesn't matter how many PhDs you have. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter who your family is. It doesn't matter how beautiful or strong you are. You are nothing before God without Christ. Merry Christmas. <laughs> right? These men were humble, and I just pray that our church would be a church full of humble people because you know what's attractive? Humility. Man, we love humble people, don't we? And we're just naturally repulsed by arrogant people, aren't we? Because in our gut, we know, like, you're not that. You're not all that. Right? The second characteristic of true Christianity is humility. Here's the third one. Letter C, generosity. Generosity. Look back at verse 11. It says this, Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Do you notice how seamless that transition was? They went right from worship into offering. Why is that? Because when Jesus is your treasure, you give him your treasures. They wanted to give gifts to Jesus. No one commanded them to. It wasn't like Joseph got up and was like, well, now it's the time for offering in the service. And if you would please give, we can start a new ministry, right? No, like they just wanted to give because they'd been born again. Here's the truth. One of the clearest indications that you've truly been born again is you want to give. You want to give. You want to be generous. And here's what we know. It's easy to play church, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to play church. Anybody can show up here and sit in a chair and even raise their hand in a song, go to a Bible study, right? And nod your head at the right moment and sound, hmm, that's good, you know? But you know what we can't play with? We can't play with our schedules or our budgets. You just can't. Like your schedule and your budget show beyond a shadow of a doubt what you value in life. They just do. And so as we end 2020, it's worth looking back at your time and at your money and saying, what do these things demonstrate I care most about? Do they demonstrate that Jesus is the greatest treasure in my life? For these wise men, their conversion led to generosity. They treasured Jesus, so they wanted to give their treasures to Jesus. And my prayer for our church is that we would become a radically generous church. Not because we have to, not because you feel guilty or I preach a good sermon, but because you want to. Because you look at Jesus who was rich, but for your sake became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. And you would say, I want to offer my gifts to him. I want to glorify him in giving. And you know what's amazing? When we do that, God uses it to advance his mission in the world. You see it in this text. Think about what these gifts would have meant for Jesus' family. Mary and Joseph had rent for probably the next year. They, they could buy food. They could buy new clothing. They could afford the trip back to Galilee or actually down to Egypt after this. 
You see, God used the generosity of the wise men to provide for Jesus in his infancy. God does that today. He uses the generosity of his people to push his mission forward in the world. And I'm grateful because we have a lot of really generous people in our church. We do. I praise God for you, and I'm grateful for you. And because of your generosity this year, we've been able to do some pretty awesome things. And each week of the month of December, we've been able to announce a pretty large gift to different ministries. So two weeks ago, we announced a gift to Thrive Pregnancy Center here in Charlottesville. And last week, we announced a gift to Steel City Church doing ministry in the east end of Pittsburgh. And tonight, I'm so thrilled to let you know that we're going to be able to give $2,500 to our missionary partners in Central India to launch that video project they're doing. So they've got this incredible idea to reach more people with the gospel and to, and to overcome language barriers, but they need money. To, I mean, stuff takes money, right? And because of your generosity, we're able to say, hey, we're going to get it off the ground. Here, here's a gift to get going when to put wind in your sails, and I cannot tell you what a joy it was to tell them that. And that's because of your giving. So thank you. So thank you. God used it then, and God still uses the generosity of his people today to move his mission forward in the world. So the question to ask is, are you generous? I know we all want to fit in category C, don't we? We want to be like, yes, I'm adoring Jesus. I'm not angry at him. I'm certainly not apathetic. I adore the Lord Jesus, right? The question, though, is, is your life defined by joy and humility and generosity? It's like, ooh, right? Or maybe you're more honest than me, and you're just like, nope, I'm in category A. I'm angry. Like, I'm angry at what the Bible says. I don't like it. Or, Josh, you caught me. I'm apathetic. I'm only here because somebody dragged me tonight. And so probably the more important question is not even what category you're in, but how do you change categories, right? Because if you're in the adoration category, I mean, if you're anything like me, you don't say they're long, right? And if you're the other categories, how do you move? Well, the answer is that you do the same thing that the wise men did. You gaze at the incarnation. You fix your eyes on the glory of Christmas that you cannot go to God, so God came down to you. You let that marinate in your heart until it changes you. It reminds me of one of my favorite um, British authors, a woman named Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy Sayers was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford, and she wrote mystery novels, and by her own admission, she was not an attractive woman. Well, her most famous uh, series of mystery, uh, mystery novels is called The Lord Peter Whimsey Mysteries. The main character is this guy named Peter Whimsey, who's independently wealthy, and he spends his time solving crimes in London. And he has it all. I mean, he's famous, he's wealthy, half the women in London want to marry him, but you get a couple books into the series and you realize he is utterly miserable. He's miserable and he's starting to spiral. He's starting to spiral out of control. And then about book six, a new character is introduced. And the character's name is Harriet Vane. And Harriet and Peter hit it off and after this long kind of, you know, cat and mouse game of pursuit, they end up getting married and, and she basically saves Peter. He comes out of his tailspin, he comes out of his spiral, and they live happily ever after. Now, here's what's interesting about Harriet Vane. She was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford. In the book series, she writes mystery novels, and in the book series, she is described as being unattractive. Who does that remind you of? Dorothy Sayers. You see, this is what happened. Dorothy Sayers created a character and fell in love with that character. But her character was hopeless. Her character was spiraling. So what did she do? She wrote herself into the story to save him. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. You and I are utterly hopeless. It doesn't matter how much money, fame, or achievement you get, you are spiraling. And unless something changes, you are going to hell. But God loves you so much, he wrote himself into the story into a manger as a baby 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Why? So that you could be saved. So that you could be saved. The real meaning of Christmas is Emmanuel. God with us. You could never get up to God. I could never get up to God. But in his love and great mercy, he came down to us. And friends, when you gaze at that truth and you think on that truth, it will transform you. You'll no longer be Herod. You'll no longer be the religious leaders but you will be like those wise men so many years ago who fell down and worshiped him. Let it be so in 2021. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for your generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, this Christmas, I pray that that message will be very sharp and clear in our minds. Lord, for those here tonight who do not know you, who do not have a genuine relationship with you, that they would begin one through repentance and faith. 
And for those who do have a relationship with you, that they would be encouraged and built up and inspired by the Christmas story to delight in you and to treasure you more and to persevere in the calling that you place upon their lives. God, make us a church full of joy. Make us a church full of humility. Make us a church full of generosity that glorifies you. We love you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, in response to Christmas, would you stand?